Hello, I'm Dr. Carolyn Custer, and today we're going to talk about nutrition. I coordinate the Motion Coalition at Authority Health, whose mission is combating childhood obesity and promoting health and wellness in our communities. Today, we're very pleased to have the co-chair of the coalition, Dr. William Dietz, with us. Dr. Dietz is the director of the Sumner M. Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness and a professor at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Thank you so much for, have, for being with us today, Dr. Dietz. Nice to be here, Carolyn. Thank you for inviting me. Great. So let's get started. March is Nutrition Month. From your perspective as a pediatrician who specializes in child obesity, what message would you like to share with the Authority Health community? Well, thanks for that question. I, I think the most important nutritional problem that we have today is obesity, which is a significant problem in both children and adults. About 20% of children and um, 30, well now 42% of adults now have obesity. And we've kind of lost track of that because of the preoccupation with COVID-19. But it's important to recognize that obesity is a major risk factor for the severity of COVID-19 uh, infections and even death attributable to COVID-19. Um, in the lockdown, it's been hard to control um, weight because people are reliant on ultra processed foods, which we know in increase obesity. Uh, we know that um, people are less active and I think we can anticipate that this epidemic, the pandemic of COVID-19, is going to increase the severity of obesity in our population. Uh, but I'm hoping that the COVID-19 experience will also renew our efforts to control obesity in adults and children. Such an important time. All right, thank you for that answer. We've been in the grips of the coronavirus pandemic for about a year now. You've um, written about the intersection of, on, of COVID-19 on obesity, food insecurity, and um, climate change, which you call a syndemic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by this? Well, what you're referring to um, is a paper in The Lancet that we published in February of 2019 entitled The Global, Pand the, the Global Syndemic of Obesity Under Nutrition and Climate Change. And a we declared climate change a pandemic so that we really had these three pandemics of obesity, undernutrition, and climate change. And a syndemic uh, is an interaction of two or more pandemics or epidemics, each of which has a negative effect on the other. And these are all driven by social or economic factors. So take um, the, the whole issue of uh, cattle production. So cattle production release, releases methane, which increases CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Um, the increase in greenhouse gases uh, is associated with reduced crop yields and reduced micronutrient concentrations in foods that are, that are produced. So that contributes to undernutrition and the gases themselves contribute to climate change and the uh, consumption of beef is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and obesity. So if we, reduce, if we reduce beef consumption, we improve human health, we improve the climate, and we it decrease the likelihood that this is going to have a negative effect on the foods that we produce. Such an important message to share with everyone. Well, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is um, that this COVID-19 now has produced another syndemic. This syndemic is COVID-19, obesity, and food insecurity. And we know that food insecurity is associated with obesity. We know that COVID-19 uh, affects the severity of obesity and the, um, the number of deaths of, uh, of, uh, attributable to obesity in turn reflect on, on COVID-19. So we have this interaction of these now three other pandemics that are superimposed on the obesity pandemic. Okay. You've recently published an academic paper on the impact of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Can you tell us a little bit more about the act and its implications? Right. The, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act <clears throat> was um, a major piece of legislation that affected the standards applied to school nutritional foods. So this is the uh, 
the breakfast and, and lunch programs, the National School Lunch Pro Program, the National School Breakfast Program. And in 2010 or 2011, I, I think it was, um, the standards required, and they changed, and they, they required uh, a cup of fruit and a cup of vegetables at, be offered at every meal. They reduced the fat content of milk. And they also ma mandated that uh, over 50% of all grains be whole grains. And in the years that followed, um, this was shown to uh, account for a 47% decrease in the prevalence of obesity in the lowest income group that was consuming the national school lunch. And uh, the other piece of data, which uh, was confirmed by several studies, was that the quality of foods consumed by kids who were consuming the school lunch improved markedly. This was the healthy eating index, which assessed the, the, the whole positivity of the lunch. So those changes, which changed the school food pattern not directed at decreasing calories, but changing the school food pattern reduced the prevalence of obesity. The concern that we now have is that with COVID-19, people are, um, the, the, the distribution of foods by schools uh, may, be, may not be able to meet those same standards. So that the positive effects that this program had on the obesity and, um, and the study that was done was in adolescents those positive effects on adolescents may be eliminated because of the impact of the COVID-19 on school feeding programs. So it's difficult for schools to access the healthy foods that they want or need to provide. Exactly. Understand. It is a challenging time. Um, let's talk a little bit more about food insecurity. There's been some discussion about how WIC enrollment may decrease, increasing in WIC enrollment may decrease in food insecurity and the prevalence of obesity. Can you tell us more about that? Well, the changes in the WIC program are another example of changes in the food pattern and its positive impact on obesity, that is reducing the prevalence of obesity. So in 2009, a report from the Institute of Medicine recommended changes in the WIC food package to increase fruits and vegetables, to decrease juice, to decrease milk, and decrease the calorie content uh, of milk. Um, and uh, also the, the uh, quantity of juice that was recommended. And in the years that followed up through 2016, we saw a decrease in the prevalence of obesity among two to four-year-olds in, enrolled in WIC. Only about 30% of children eligible for WIC uh, in the age group of two to four receive WIC. But as food insecurity has increased during the pandemic, it's essential that we keep that we maintain or even increase enrollment in WIC to address the issue of uh, food insecurity and, as we know from the WIC package, prevent obesity. Mm -hmm. There's many benefits to the WIC program. Right. All right. All right, I'd like to take a moment to tell our audience that Authority Health is proud to sponsor the Motion Coalition, which convenes many of the organizations and individuals concerned with childhood obesity in the region. We are committed to promoting healthy eating and active living, and we're so pleased to have Dr. Dietz as one of our co-chairs. For more information on the Motion Coalition, please visit our website at www.authorityhealth.org. Let's go on to our next question. One of the topics we've discussed in motion is how to create an equitable and resilient food system. What thoughts do you have about this? Well, it's an important question because one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed is the vulnerability of the food system, particularly the uh, vulnerability of workers, essential workers along the food supply chain. So this begins in the fields and then uh, applies to those uh, workers in processing plants and then to the um, people who transport those foods to the retail, the grocery stores that sell them. And COVID-19 has disrupted this food supply chain. Um, we saw that when there were high rates of infections, of COVID-19 infections among workers in a meat processing plant in the, in the Midwest, and prices have increased, food supply has decreased. And I believe that uh, if we rely more on a local and regional food system than the industrialized food system, we could avert some of those problems. And as climate change moves forward and impairs, um, that causes the floods or the fires or, or whatever, 
regional food systems and local food systems become more important. Mm -hmm. The other advantage of those food systems is that they can pivot, that small farms are much more agile than large farms. Uh, and if one product fails because of climate, another one could be produced. So I think um, this is a, a field that I think deserves greater ex exploration. Uh, we don't, uh, right now it's a hypothesis, it's a theory um, that, but I do believe that what the COVID-19 pandemic has done was to expose just how vulnerable the industrialized food system is. And the need for having that regional system that you described. Okay, so obesity is a focus of your work, obviously. Um, what other issues regarding nutrition in children and nutrition in general should we know about? Well, I think that the prevention of obesity in young children begins with breastfeeding. Uh, we know that, um, that breastfeeding is the healthiest, that breast milk is the healthiest food for infants. We also know that the, um, when sugary drinks are introduced early in life, um, in the first year of life, that children who consume those sugary drinks are much more likely to develop obesity uh, later, like at age six years. Um, the other important challenge ar around early feeding is to delay the introduction of complementary foods uh, to between four and six months. Um, we know that earlier introduction of complementary foods are generally associated with high calorie uh, foods, uh, and those are, are not particularly healthy for infants. I think another strategy here is changing the way we feed infants. That um, infants can control their own food intake. They're capable of doing this. And I think one of the reasons that children who are breastfed as opposed to children who are formula fed uh, tend to have a lower rate of obesity is that when uh, the child is breastfeeding and stops breastfeeding, um, there's no way to know the, that the child needs more or, or not, that that whole food intake is at the discretion of the infant. Mm -hmm. Whereas when a, an infant is formula fed, uh, parents and caretakers tend to look at the bottle as a monitor for whether the infant has had enough to eat or not. When And the other thing is that's interesting is that the healthiest diets for infants in terms of fruit and vegetable intake uh, occur during infancy. When the child moves on to the family diet, their consumption of fruits and vegetables decrease. So the subsequent challenge for feeding infants uh, and, and now toddlers and younger children healthfully is to uh, assure that the family is eating well. Um, and again, uh, a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables, low in ultra processed foods is one that is much more likely to uh, keep infants, children, and for that matter, teenagers and adults at a healthy weight, as opposed to uh, an ultra processed food diet, which uh, contains, uh, which we know is associated with increased body weight. It's a family effort and it's certainly a community effort. It's also important to recognize that the successful prevention of obesity depends on changing the food and physical activity environments. This is not just a family problem. This is a cultural and, and sociologic problem that affects our entire population. Um, the access to fresh fruits and vegetables is limited in many communities with a high prevalence of obesity. The opportunities for safe physical activity is also limited. Um, and these uh, contribute to the, the, the problem of obesity. And by the way, they also contribute to climate change. So just think about transport. If you're reliant on a car, we know that there's a higher prevalence of obesity in people who drive a lot, as opposed to people who live in settings, urban settings, that have public transport available. Because when you use public transport, you're more physically active. You have to walk to catch the bus or the subway, and you have to walk from there to your office or to your place of work. So that uh, the, the physical transport, bicycling, walking, are much healthier, um, both for the person and for the planet. It's a really good point. So we really do need to take a step back and kind of look at the big picture and rethink how we're doing some of these things. Right. Um, we recognize that this requires a cultural transformation, but mm -hmm. if we don't do it, we're going to continue to have this raging pandemic of obesity 
and we're not likely to hit the numbers that we need to hit to reduce climate change. Which is very important. All right, Dr. Dietz, I've enjoyed talking with you today. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the Authority Health community? Uh, no, I, I thank you, Carolyn, for the opportunity to, to meet with you and to answer these questions. And I hope that the um, motion community will stay well and healthy and active. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Dr. Dietz for joining us today for a conversation on nutrition and for dedicating time to serve as co-chair of the Motion Coalition. Let's use this month to improve nutrition in our lives and in our society. I'm Carolyn Custer for Authority Health.